Prezzo. Let's see, here we go. All right. So our first slide is going to be probably first few slides, right, Tammy? <laughs> it's going to be membership. Absolutely. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. So we have not met in a few months, and I have a whole new list of people that we would just like to take a moment to recognize. And look at this. We've got a whole bunch of new members that have joined us over the summer. Thank you. If you are here today, we are happy to have you and are glad to have you engaged with PMI WIC. Welcome. If we can go to the next slide, please. And not only have we got a whole bunch of new members this summer, you have been working on your certifications. Look at this list. This is excellent. There are a lot of people that have earned everything from micro credentials to uh, PMPs and the CAPM. Great stuff here. If you are here and you see your name here and you have received this honor, congratulations. We are here to support you. Next page. And as we're looking at this for the last quarter, we have a lot of anniversaries. Looks like last year we had about 24 people on our first year and 22 people that have been with us for five years. How amazing is that? Congratulations. Happy anniversary. And then we have tenure and people with more than 20 years with PMI WIC, which is amazing because this year we are celebrating our 25th year. So Anthony, George, Joanne, and Laura, thank you for sticking with us. Thank you for being a part of our success. I'd also like to recognize Rod, George, and Laura, they are either current or previous board members. So thank you for your support of the organization. It's because of your involvement that we are here where we are today. Thank you so much. Next page. Last year, just to give you a brief update, we had some conversations with members and in the focus group forum and came up with a number of things that we wanted to do. So this year we have taken some of that feedback that came from you, our membership, and we are applying it to our objectives for this year. And you can see those listed on the screen that right in front of you. So <clears throat> we're really trying to improve the way that we support you and that we engage with you and also to give you more opportunities to volunteer both in the community as well as volunteering opportunities with the board and to actually develop some of your PM skills. So look for more great things to come. Just wanted you to know that your feedback has been heard and we're building that into what we do. Next page. One of the things we wanted to share is about the volunteer engagement platform. Hopefully you've seen a little bit about this. This is where we are putting our volunteering opportunities for different positions within the board and different areas to support. This is available through your PMI.org account and it has some instructions here and you'll be able to capture that. We're regularly updating these with new positions as they become available. So please go and check it out. All you need to do is search for the Western Idaho chapter in the search fields, and you will see everything that is available to you to, you, to help out our local group. Next page, please. And then as one final reminder, I think this is my last one. We still have Project Bytes available to all PMI WIC members. All you need to do is send me an email with your name and information saying that, hey, I want access to Project Bytes, and we will give you information that you can use to create an account. It is totally free to you. They are little videos and audio clips that are about 20 minutes long. Listen to two or three of those, and the next thing you know, you have been earning PDUs. Once again, this is a great opportunity. You can use it to search for and learn more about any topics that interest you or that you're thinking about at work or at home. So Project Bytes, think about it. Just send me an email, vpmembership at pmiwic.org. 
Awesome. Thanks, Tammy. Appreciate that report out. Lots of good information. And yeah, Project Bytes is growing. Gosh, there are over 300 selections and I was taking a look at that today. It's awesome. Okay. Um, Allison, do you want to give us a marketing update? I know you're wearing two hats tonight, so... <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So very quickly, um, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining. I wish I could see everybody's faces, but my computer is being a little bit weird. However, I hope that you all here are following us on your favorite social media platform. You have three options, LinkedIn, Facebook, or YouTube. The YouTube channel is a great place to go to catch up on any past content that you might have missed and earn some PDUs for watching videos on the PMI Western Idaho Chapters channel. We do have a new Facebook page, and then we have a pretty active LinkedIn page. So this is a great way to find out what's going on in addition to looking at all of the events coming up on the website. We also have a couple of volunteer opportunities that are open and will be updated soon, I promise, on the VEP. But if you are interested, please feel free to reach out either through VEP or through our email. And I can put that into the chat, but it's um, VP underscore marketing at PMI Western Idaho chapter dot org. And that's not spelled out. So I'll put it in chat. But that is all I have. Awesome. That's a great report and super exciting. And yeah, I was noticing the other day when I was uh, posting the uh, video for our September 13th Lunch and Learn, we're getting some hits on our videos out there. People are finding it. So that's great. Nice. Okay. Do we have LaDonna? Well, let's we, see. We do. We do. Right? Awesome. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. Five by five. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Yeah. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. I am here to talk about um, some of the work we're doing in the area of professional development. Um, we are in the just launching our mentorship program this uh, session. It's in full swing. Uh, it's a wonderful program. It it's an opportunity for people who are tenured project managers to share their expertise to, with folks who are new to the field. It's an opportunity for folks who are new to the field to, to gain that expertise from those mentors. So um, we've got a full slate of mentors and mentees for this session. The winter session opens in November. So if you're looking for a professional development volunteer opportunity, um, you absolutely mark that on your calendar for when we open that up. So if you want more information about the program, you can visit pmiwic.org slash mentorship. Awesome. Next slide. All okay. right. And then um, we're really excited. We want you all to mark on your calendar. The Professional Development Day is going to be held March 1st, 2024. Um, our uh, theme is Achieve. It's going to be held at Boise State University. We're going to have a keynote, nine breakout speakers, great prize drawings, a buffet lunch, and parking will be included. And if you drive around Boise much at all, you know <laughs> how valuable that is. So um, stay tuned for more information on this. And as we get closer to the time of the event, I will also be posting opportunities to volunteer to help us with the professional development day closer to the, the event date. So um, it's gonna be a great event this year and we're looking forward to having y'all join us. Excellent, it is gonna be great. Um, and I was just talking with them, some one of our um, meeting participants, Steve Kirsch, and he had signed up for uh, to help out with events to take pictures and he's still interested. So he's gonna be looking for you to um, put those volunteer opportunities out there so he can respond. That's awesome. Great. Yeah. All right. I don't know. Oh, we have upcoming events next. Okay. Awesome. Well, I can do some of this. Uh, so October 11th, Lunch and Learn, we are having um, Michael Roberts do a presentation on how to future-proof your career with um, generative AI and machine learning. So should be interesting. Um, he's done this presentation before. He's done it for Project Bytes. Some of you may have seen it. This will be a live webinar. So we'll be able to take questions live for him and should be great. 
looking forward to that. Uh, October 25th is going to be a workshop. Um, to Tammy's point, during her focus group, some of the feedback was, would really like to have more workshops and more things that are sort of hands-on and things where you can take away uh, knowledge right away and apply it. So hopefully uh, you'll be able to come to our case study workshop, which will be October 25th. I believe, well, I'm not going to say where it's located because I think Janelle's still looking. <laughs> but um, at any rate, uh, hopefully we'll see you then. And uh, December 1st, Tammy, you want to talk about Idaho Food Bank and our Wake Up Boise events? Sure, absolutely. So uh, we are trying to round out the year with a great, another great event at Idaho Food Bank on December 1st. We're going to do Crazy Hat Day. And if you have been to the Idaho Food Bank, you know what a wonderful operation they have and what a difference they make in the community. This is a PDU earning event, totally free for you to attend. We do meet once a quarter and it's going to be a celebration. So we hope that you're there. It's going to be Crazy Hat Day. Sign up and we'll see you there. Awesome. Rake Up Boise is also something that we as an organization support on an annual basis. Right now, the target date is November 11th. But if something happens and like the leaves are still on the trees like they were last year at that date, we might have to move the date a little bit. This is totally a family friendly, friends friendly. Anybody can come and join us. You sign up, we provide the bags, you provide the rakes, and we have a good time uh, helping those in our communities who, who can't really get out there and work on their yards themselves. So this is a great service that PMI WIC does for our local area, and we'd love to have you there. We can take any number of people, any age, it's going to be great. So please watch your mailers and sign up. Thank you. Yeah, great, Timmy. Love that event every year. Try to go. And it's a great community impact event for our chapters. So, yep, awesome. And hopefully, like you said, um, leaves will be done. We'll be able to do it on the 11th. But you never know, right? Just like project management, you never know how the schedule is going to go. <laughs> All right. Well, for tonight's presentation, we kind of whizzed through some of that stuff. We usually are a little bit longer, but we had a couple of folks out tonight. So quick presentation on board report. So we're jumping into tonight's presentation, which is on career management. It's not just a one and done uh, destination. Uh, this is more of a discussion about a career journey, right? Stops and starts, route changes along the way. Um, so we thank you all for attending tonight's uh, annual career panel event, and hopefully you'll pick up some travel tips uh, along the way for your career journey. So if you'll uh, bear with me for just a second, I'm going to switch gears here and stop presenting for two shakes. Great, by hook or by crook, by golly. Okay. All right. So just so everyone knows, um, career panel event, we are going to be using our session window, which has in it chat, polls, people, Q&A. We won't be using polls tonight. And as most of you know, we use our chat window to talk amongst ourselves and greet everyone and, and make general comments. We're going to use Q&A um, to actually pose questions to our panel. And we're hoping that we can uh, interject some questions as we do the, the discussions this evening, and we have our different topic sections. So as we finish talking about a topic, we'll open it up for a Q&A at that point. If we have questions, great. If we don't, we'll move on to the next section. So we'll see how that goes. And hopefully that makes sense to everybody. And let's get rolling. So we're going to start with introductions, and it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Allison Garrow. Um, Allison serves as the Education Director for Mission 43. It's a role where she creates educational pathways that align with the evolving needs of Idaho's growing economy to help veterans and military spouses find meaningful employment after their service in the military. She firmly believes in fostering diverse thought and leadership and is dedicated to inclusivity and educational empowerment, ensuring that quality education is accessible and available, allowing veterans and military spouses across Idaho to achieve their fullest potential. 
With her career spanning over 15 years, um, Allison brings a wealth of project and program management expertise in both government and nonprofit spaces. And further, she's no stranger to academic excellence, having earned a Master of Public Administration from the University of Texas Ar at Arlington. <clears throat> Excuse me. In addition to her role at Mission 43, she actively contributes to the project management community. She is on our board of directors. She is the vice president of marketing for our PMI Western Idaho chapter. For those of you who were in earlier, you heard her give her board report. As well, her dedication to educational excellence extends to Boise State University, where she serves as an affiliate faculty member, focusing on designing and instructing courses in project management. Um, Allison's passion for educational advocacy and project management expertise, as well as her efforts in creating professional opportunities for those who served our nation and their families are both commendable and inspiring. As a panelist, Allison will share her valuable insights and experiences in education and its intersection with Idaho's veterans and their spouses and the ever-changing needs of Idaho's growing economy. So welcome, Allison. Did you want to say anything quickly before we move on to the next panelist? Cheryl, can it possibly say anything else? <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> no, you rock, my friend. You rock. All right. I would like to now introduce Todd Norton. He's the Director of Online Initiatives at Boise State University. Todd is a distinguished professional with over 15 years of administrative experience in higher education. He is a thought leader who places a strong emphasis on not only creating new educational programs and advancing education through digital platforms, but also restructuring existing ones to align with the evolving professional needs of the community. Before joining Boise State University, Todd was the department chair in the Edward R. Murrow College of Communication at Washington State University. As well, he held other important faculty roles, including director of the Center for Environmental Research, Education and Outreach, and Emergency Management Training Officer. In his tenure at Boise State University, he was the head of the Department of Communication and Media before becoming the director for online initiatives for the College of Arts and Science. One of Todd's passions lies in project management stemming from his appreciation for processes that bring people together and drive meaningful organizational change. His commitment to excellence and his ability to bring innovation to academic settings truly set him apart. As a panelist, Todd will share his insights and experiences of higher education and online initiatives in project management education. Thanks Todd for joining us on the panel tonight. Is there anything you'd like to say? I would just like to uh, thank you uh, for inviting me here and really looking forward and uh, appreciate the opportunity to be with the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Brian Johnson, Director of Strategy and Execution and EPMO Oversight for Blue Cross of Idaho. With over 25 years of experience, Brian has consistently demonstrated his ability to lead high-performing teams and drive strategic initiatives to fruition. His career journey began with the management of sizable or operational teams uh, for a major, excuse me, major <clears throat> national bank where he honed his skills in the complex world of banking operations. He subsequently ventured into consulting and establishing and successfully running his own company where his expertise expanded as he assumed the role of project director for the state of Idaho, pioneering one of the country's first health data exchanges, an endeavor that showcased his deep understanding of the healthcare landscape and the importance of data interoperability. And data interoperability, I wanna tell you guys, is hard to say fast five times, so I'm glad I just got that out. And <laughs> so thanks for that, Brian. <laughs> for, the, for the past decade, Brian has led the evolution of the Enterprise Project Management Office, the EPMO at Blue Cross of Idaho, demonstrating his ability to successfully orchestrate organizational growth and efficiency. As a director within the strategy and execution team, he has played a vital role in crafting and executing strategic plans for Blue Cross of Idaho, steering it towards sustainable growth and success. As a panelist, Brian will share his organizational experience and his insights as a strategic project leader. Brian, welcome. Thanks for joining the panel this year. Is there anything you'd like to add? Cheryl, just thank you for the great introduction and uh, good evening, everybody. I want to just jump in and say I apologize for that mugshot in my profile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> I'm that picture indicates, but uh, I'm really yeah. happy to be a part of this great group of panelists tonight, and uh, to be able to share some of my, you know, experience and insights into the project management profession. 
Awesome. Thank you, Brian. All right, now I'd like to introduce Amanda Clock. Uh, this is someone I think many of you know from the area, from the community um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, recruiting and technical talent. I would like to introduce Amanda Clock, recruiting and delivery lead at Xperis. Amanda is an experienced professional in talent acquisition and workforce solutions who brings her personal integrity and her business acumen to every relationship she cultivates. With over two decades of talent acquisition and retention strategy experience, she's passionate about strategizing with her clients, companies, and talent alike to identify and deliver effective workforce solutions. Amanda's dedication goes beyond her professional role. She actively engages with numerous local and national professional associations. For example, Amanda serves on the board of the Human Resources Association of Treasure Valley, leveraging her expertise to contribute to the industry and advance its practices. Additionally, Amanda's contributions extend to initiatives like Girls on the Run, Builders Club, Guardian at Lightem, CASA, Idaho Food Bank and Idaho Humane Society, among others. Amanda has participated as a panelist for our annual career panel events on multiple occasions. And as a panelist, her insights into the job market and trends are always invaluable. So we welcome you again, Amanda, and thank you so much for joining us once more. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm actually in, in Utah this week for Silicon Slopes and Tony Robbins was a keynote speaker today. And he said that something that was really like just touched me. He said that passion unused weakens. So I just appreciate the opportunity because I'm very passionate about career navigation, facilitation, the journey, and also appreciate you allowing me to exercise my passion and <laughs> connect with everyone. Absolutely. I kind of doubt your passion would ever weaken, but <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks again. All right. And last, but certainly not least, a new member to our panel, Josh Simons. Um, I'd like to introduce Josh Simons, the Senior Managing Director at Apex Systems. Josh's journey into the world of IT and talent acquisition has been shaped by experiences that have not only brought him to the heart of the industry, but also to the vibrant community of Boise. Hailing from Las Vegas and starting his journey there, Josh's story took a life-changing turn when he met his future wife at UNLV, which would eventually lead them both to Boise in June of 2019. Since then, Boise has been more than a location. It's become a thriving backdrop to Josh's passion for IT, talent management, and community engagement. In December 2019, he joined the ranks of Apex Systems, rising from account manager to assume his current role of managing director. And as managing director, he uses his talent acquisition experience and expertise to connect local companies with top tier IT talent. And most recently, Josh is committed to be a resource for our chapter members. Awesome. He plans to assist with resume writing and providing insights into the ever evolving IT job market. Truly appreciate that, Josh. That's awesome. His dedication to the community and its growth is evident, and his willingness to share knowledge is a testament to his leadership and collaborative spirit. As a panelist, Josh will share his insights and experiences in the information technology sector and IT employment landscape in Boise. So welcome, Josh. Thank you, Cheryl, and uh, thanks for having me. Really excited to be here and looking forward to the discussion. Absolutely. Great. All right, guys. Well, we're going to jump right into our first uh, discussion topic, which is um, our career journey. And so uh, let's jump. Did it go? Oh, it doesn't look like it's been advancing the slides. Okay. That's interesting. I apologize. It was it's advancing for me, but not for you guys. All right. Now let's you'll jump. get the joke about my mugshot. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. Let me see if I can do it like that. Interesting. Okay. So now we're on the current slide. I'm using the speaker notes in one window and using the slide deck in the other. And apparently I have to be careful about where my cursor is. So apologies for that, guys. Um, okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about career journey and we're going to have our panelists describe their career journeys um, and kind of talk to us about the mentors who may have shaped uh, their career decisions and what some of the benefits of that were and the impact. Um, we've got, let's see, 
I need to go back to this one. Okay. So we're going to ask each of you to kind of share a specific time in your professional life when you benefited from mentoring or coaching in your career, what insight that um, it provided you to educate, recruit, manage others in your organization. So I'm just going to randomly, um, Josh, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, gosh, I feel like I've had a lot of mentors throughout my career. Um, but I would say most importantly, you have to find your mentor naturally. It can't be a forced thing. So I guess one of the things when I was planning on taking the position with Apex, um, I had a friend down in Vegas and it's just nice to have someone to talk through like your thoughts and get them out loud and hear, uh, hear someone's opinion. So mm -hmm. like I said earlier, I think having a mentor is just something that has to come naturally and someone that you can trust, but also someone that can tell you what you need to hear rather than what you want to hear. Right. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. The, the, what you want to hear isn't really what you need to hear. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Understood. All right. Well, thank you for sharing. Um, let's go to Todd. Thanks so much. Um, it, mine's not that dissimilar, actually. So I think of um, organizational change, and I've always been interested in processes that help facilitate organizational change. And uh, while I was at um, Washington State University in the Murrow College, we were uh, pretty significantly shifting our college structure around, and in particular, academic programs. And I found myself, I didn't realize I had sort of gotten there, but I had found myself uh, at the end of resisting some change. And uh, my associate dean at the time, Prabhu David, he's now, uh, he was then, at, he went to uh, Michigan State thereafter, he's now on the East Coast somewhere, uh, helped me through a process, recognize that about myself and uh, recognize sort of why I was resisting that change. That's, and that's actually really helped me quite a bit because I was resisting the change, not because I disagreed with it, just but because... I didn't feel like we had sort of gotten enough credit for the accomplishments that we uh, that we had uh, that we, you know that we had made over the last few years, and so, in a sense, that helped me become a little bit empathetic uh, to to folks who tend to resist change, and that's been really important because I spend a lot of time um, trying to restructure or uh, create new programs. So that's been that's been helpful for me. Awesome, thank you for sharing, um, Allison. You know, I think. There's this phrase, and I can't remember exactly how it goes, but you're the sum of X amount of people that are closest to you. And I think now in my career, that is exactly how I view mentorship. I don't have just one mentor. I have several different mentors in several different areas in a lot of areas that I would like to improve and get better. And I find that I go to friends and coworkers for different things. But I think Early on in my career, something that really impacted and maybe changed my trajectory was that um, outside of the military and transitioning into civilian work, I had someone sit down and I was kind of hitting brick walls on employment, hitting brick walls. I went from avionics and um, aircraft maintenance into a completely different world. And I had someone sit down and explain to me, hey, your skills are transferable and this is how you talk about it. And honestly, if I didn't have that mentorship of mm -hmm. being able to use a different language, but the same skills applying to all these different jobs, I wouldn't be here today. And I, and I wouldn't have the experience that I have in several different fields. And, and truly, I, I hope everybody could hear that whether they're military or not, reskilling, upskilling is very difficult. And, you know, you just need to learn to speak the language of how your skills are valued across the board. Right. Be able to translate that into the, the new environment. Yeah. Love that. That's true. So true. Thank you for sharing. Uh, let's see. Let's go to Amanda. I can echo what, what everybody has shared. I consider my life, I have a board of directors for my life. And some people don't even know that they're mentors to me. It's just that I look to them and how they align in their life and, and what they do to advance. And some people on, actually on this call are mentors to me and in this um, community that maybe don't even know that they're mentors to me. But I do <laughs> think that one of the biggest things I can remember early on in my career, my very first call, sales call, and I picked up the phone, could not get my words out, tripped over everything. And Alan Erickson, I still remember him. He uh, he was the client that I was calling and and he said, Amanda, did you say your name was Amanda? And I said, yes. And, and he said, okay, how about we do this? How about 
hang up, kind of take a breath and then call me back in 10 minutes and we're going to do this again. And my my director was standing like she was helping me, training me and shadowing. And I'm like, great, I'll do that. I hung up and I said, I am moving out of the state. I can never do my things <laughs> again. And she said, no, you're not. You're calling him back and you're going to get you're going to go through it again. And so both sides of that was mentorship to me. Um, I did call him back. I did get the deal and he and I still talk today. So it's just one of those things. And then I think how that transitions to when I mentor and I recruit and I train and coach, Mm -hmm. I think that, I mean, to quote Brene Brown, there's power and vulnerability on both sides of that. Um, Being able to be vulnerable to be mentored and then also share those vulnerabilities of when in my career, even now, there are, there are moments that I'm learning and being able to share those with that I'm those that I'm coaching to say there's hope. <laughs> also, it gets better, and this is it's a journey. It truly is a journey, and uh, just being able to be vulnerable on both sides of that has been really beneficial and, and impactful. Absolutely, yeah, I couldn't agree more. Brian, do you want to bring us home? Yeah, you bet. I think uh, maybe like some of you in the audience, I didn't start out and say. Hey, I want to get into the project management profession. Uh, in fact, I started out in banking, and honestly, uh, I realized that organically I was already doing project management activities. I would, you know, have department initiatives that I I wanted to lead, and so I would gather up all of the uh, stakeholders, the people that needed to be involved. I would, you know, organize, defining the scope and and uh, determining what we needed to deliver and when, landing out a timeline, all of those things. Uh, But one thing that was critical in my career journey is I had a great leader that really to me was a true servant leader. But he said to me one day, he said, Brian, look, you're you're doing all the work. Have you ever thought about getting your PMP? And uh, that's really was the catalyst to, uh, to going down the path of getting my project management, professional certification, and entering project management. And, you know, that's carried on with me. A couple of other things that he really related uh, that I really admired was that um, he really emphasized the importance of building relationships. And, you know, as any project manager knows, the relationship building is an important critical aspect of being a successful project manager. And really honing in on those skills, I think, was really critical. But I really attribute his uh, kind of leadership and mentorship in steering me down the path of project management. And uh, it's been a great ride so far. Yeah, those of us who've been lucky to be around, uh, those willing to pay it forward, uh, very much appreciate that. Yeah, love it. Great. Well, thanks, everybody, for sharing. So we're going to move on to our next topic, which is skills, abilities, and education. But right now, I'd like to open it up. If anyone has any questions for the panelists in terms of mentoring or any comments you'd like to make, um, if you would put those in the Q&A, that would be wonderful. We'll just take a quick second here. I guess I should announce Q&A. Confirm, notify. Okay. So now everybody should get a notification that Q&A is open. Um, I'm not seeing a lot of questions firing off, so we're going to keep on going and we'll pick that up in case somebody does uh, put something out there. So our next topic, let's make sure that I'm actually on the right screen, you guys, geez, losing my mind. Okay, there's that. Excellent. All right. So skills, abilities, and education is what we're going to talk about next. Um, Basically focusing on professional technical training programs, right? Those are trending now. Boise State now has a four-year, two-year project management program that's online. Um, Technical military expertise is a major plus. So we're going to talk a little bit about this in terms of um, how things are kind of changing up for project managers in the way of um, new skills, abilities, and education. So the first question is going to be, I think we're going to talk uh, with um, Allison, Amanda, and Jazz primarily, but of course, Todd and Brian can always jump in. So Allison, many military positions build core competencies that parallel competencies obtained through professional training and certification preparation programs. How can organizations more effectively tap into this resource pool? 
Yeah, you know, I think that that's a really good question. And it probably looks a little bit different from each for each organization. Mm -hmm. Um, I like to say that military members and veterans make great project managers. And that doesn't mean that every military member or every veteran makes a great project manager. That's just a generalized statement. Um, But they do. They have some of those core competencies that you look for in really strong PMs. Systems are learnable processes are learnable. Um, But some things that are ingrained in military members is that they are adaptable. They're great problem solvers. They have leadership experience, um, teamwork, team engagement, risk Mm -hmm. management. I mean, all of those things, right? They have a breadth of knowledge. And I think the the hardest part that I see when I come across military members that are interested in, in, in the PMP or interested in project management is that skill translation. Um, mm-hmm. Chances are, as, as you grow within the military, you have led a ton of projects. Um, we have what you call kind of special programs that are outside of your normal job duties. And I know the difference in programs and projects according to PMI, but in the military, Programs are projects. There are it's a project <laughs> environment, so it's really learning to speak that language of, hey, um, I, I, you know, I, I had the experience of someone the other day on a mentorship call, honestly, and this is a really good example. And um, they were with an employer on a mentor call, and this employer said, hey, you know, if you don't have 15 years of project management experience in a PMP, you're not getting into my organization. And the military member was like, oh man, like I don't have that. Yes, you do. You've been <laughs> in the military for 20 years. You have been managing projects for 20 mm-hmm. years. How exactly. do you identify those? So I think, you know, all that to say, for the most part, for employers to be able to tap into this market mm-hmm. is going to be twofold. One of those ways is to get our military members, our veterans, the skills and the education that they need to speak holistically about their projects that they have run, translate Mm -hmm. that military experience into what is understandable for civilian as well as PMI language. And then on the other hand, having organizations kind of broaden their spectrum and welcoming in those military members. Um, Mm -hmm. We have resources to get someone PMP certified. That's great. However, I think it's willing to listen and maybe instead of just stopping it, at, I don't see civilian equivalent experience asking questions about what that project, you know, some projects, some programs they were involved with. And I, I certainly bet you are going to find every single answer plus some <laughs> you ever want in a project manager and find that they are truly skilled and adept at doing this. Um, and then, you know, if you're if you're if you've happen. Okay. Step one and step two are complete. Those twofold tap into military organizations. Um, you know, I, I'm the education director for mission 43. I have a broad pool of project managers that you can connect with me and (laughs) come out, but I'm not the only one. So connect with those military organizations, go to those military events and you'll find someone, you'll find someone that could be a really great fit for your organization. Great. No, that's wonderful. Um, And yeah, I know between um, Mission 43, um, Idaho uh, Veterans Chamber of Commerce and Wyakin Foundation, uh, lots of opportunities to reach out and tap into that market. That's great. Amanda, um, did you want to add to that? I would love to. I think echoing again what what Allison is saying, I've worked with a number of veterans and, and current current members of the military who are looking to transition into the civilian world. And that's the first step is aligning and and knowing where the resources are. So mission 43, you know, I work with, with, um, veterans all the time. My sister, uh, retired from the Navy as an air traffic controller, and she's transitioning into the, into the, the civilian world. And she sends me her resume and I'm like, I have no idea what this means. So I said, okay, tell me what you did day to day. Tell, Walk me through what that looked like. Walk me through your accomplishments. Walk me through things that you were really proud of. So I think having somebody there, there are resources, recruiters and um, and, and Allison's uh, team and that can really help translate your resume, your skills, because they are very transferable. There are many organizations now that are dedicated to looking at the veteran population and how do we upskill them. Manpower Group, um, our parent company, did a a major manufacturing uh, project with in in the Midwest to take veterans. They're, I think, 
at the time there were 200,000 that veterans every year that are looking to transition into the civilian world. And so we took their current skills and we upskilled. We gave them formal training, um, education, and then we were we had a 95% graduation rate from that formal education. And then we're mm -hmm. able to place them. And our, our goal is over a thousand every single year that we're able to, a, vet, a veteran's able to put to work in the civilian world. So companies are looking That's at awesome. other ways to engage yeah. and to really pull from, it's a, it is an untapped market at times. It's an untapped population and talent. Mm -hmm. I mean, the dedication, the discipline, I get goosebumps talk, talking about it. It's just, uh, <laughs> there's so much there that mm -hmm companies are that fit the culture fit the exact needs the the soft skills the personality what's inside that you really can't train somebody in that 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 foundation mm -hmm. is there to then build on some of those technical and, and the hard skills if you will to mm -hmm. um, enhance the the skills and, and elevate the skills that they have or you know transfer them to to various projects in the in pmp and and project management roles so right brilliant that's great um josh what about um apex systems they do something similar it's very similar. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have something called our skill bridge program where we do help mm -hmm. with the transition from you know military to civilian life. And we also partner with a lot of organizations like Vets to PM is one of them. Um, but we do provide you know career advice or resume guidance or interview tips. Mm -hmm. So we do uh, have, like I said, that skill bridge program, which was launched pretty recently. I think it's been about a year now, but yeah, it is. Uh, it's very important to Apex, and we have a whole department that oversees that. So, if you know anyone's interested in that, like happy to to make a connection there. Yeah, I actually might reach out to you about that because I know um, our chapter has been working with the Idaho Veterans Chamber of Commerce to help with their skill bridge program to incorporate the criteria necessary to <clears throat> ensure that if someone is going to be in that internship program, they're learning some of the skills that, that whatever projects they're allowed to, to work on in that internship, they must have full control over it, right, in order for them to get their full credit to um, apply for the PMP exam as an example. Um, so yeah, interesting. Great. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll talk later. <laughs> Sounds um, good. Yeah. Um, Brian, I, I think in uh, earlier conversations uh, yesterday, did you say that Blue Cross of Idaho had something for military as well? Yeah, probably a little less formal, uh, Cheryl. Mm -hmm. We do obviously look at military and, you know, veterans. I think I echo what Allison and Amanda and Josh have said. Really great skill sets in terms of kind of that discipline, uh, that rigor, that, uh, you know, coordination, all of those great foundational things that are more qualitative. Uh, we see when we are interviewing uh, PMs that have a military background. So mm -hmm. it's really applicable in today's workforce. And, uh, you know, I think it's one of those skill sets and some of those intangible qualities that we look at uh, from our military veterans. So it's right. a great match up for a project management position. Absolutely. Um, well, good. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about <clears throat> what resources are available to former military to help them transition, but it sounds like you've, in a lot of your answers, kind of discussed some of those different programs. So I'm going to go past that question and kind of jump into, you know, from a skills, abilities, and education perspective, colleges and universities have begun to offer bachelor and associate degrees in project management. And I was going to ask Todd, how does the four-year and two-year online programs at Boise State that just started this fall um, differ from other programs? Like specifically, how do they help students prepare for PMI certification exams after graduation? I appreciate that. And on some, in some respects, so our, our program is a bit different than some of the others that we looked at. Um, they're different in the sense, I think they're different because we built them a bit differently. Uh, we spent a pretty considerable amount of time going to uh, entities that tested for project management and, you know, started off with the basic questions, what could we do as an academic program or a set of academic programs, not to compete with you, but to complement what you're doing mm -hmm. and to try mm -hmm. to prep students so that you have, in a sense, you have less work to do when they, when they come to you for testing. And Absolutely. So we right. Built programs very much in response to those, you know, to those the answers mm -hmm. that we got. Uh, we have um, the programs that we have are very streamlined in the sense, and they also emphasize experiential learning. So it's not mm -hmm. in some respects, it's uh, it's it's a lot like what the other uh, panelists have talked about. 
So on the experiential learning side, so our programs, uh, so first of all, we have a certificate and a bachelor's. And in a sense, they're meant, they're intended to be mirror images of one another. In other words, what we saw in the workforce data was a lot of people who have an area of specialization, whether that's construction, uh, if it's technology, it's business, whatever it might be, with the need to have project management as an associated skill. But we also saw a, a pretty significant incre increase in people wanting job ads, asking for project management people and having familiarization with the area that they would they would be working in. And so our bachelor's and cert, uh, certificate sort of uh, work in combination, or you could take, you could sort of take either one and um, to suit your needs. Mm -hmm. The other way I think that in some ways that we're similar to some of the other panelists is that we emphasize experiential learning very considerably, right? And so we have in our, we have uh, four core classes. So that's about 12 credits in our major and we actually we emphasize we built experiential learning opportunities to match uh, the PMP exam and mm -hmm. expectations. So right. we take very seriously the idea that students need to work in that um, that job right and have those duties, and we try to honor the fact that they're that they're doing that sort of work right. So we have um, in the university we have a, a process called credit for prior learning, mm -hmm. and I have several students going through that right now. So, uh, in fact, one uh, one student I know for certain uh, is translating military experience through credit for prior learning to get credit for having uh, done internship credit. And there's like 12 credits of internship credit required for the program. So we really tried to mirror and reflect that experiential learning component that you might mm -hmm. have other sorts of programs like Allison's and Amanda's and Josh's mm -hmm. and, and Ryan's in the academic program. Excellent. Well, I know um, as uh, myself personally, I'm, I'm helping out with the mentoring uh, cohort this fall, and I have two students from your program uh, with whom I just met in the last couple of days, and they will be my mentees. So I'm looking forward to working with them, and they are very excited to be part of your program. So pretty exciting stuff. That's great. Um, let's see. So Brian, what advice would you give someone who is interested in project management? I mean, as a career, let's say they're just starting out, they've got their four-year degree, they have less than, say, two years of professional experience. How would you advise them? Well, you know, as, as arduous so, as it might seem, when you come out of college, I know a lot of uh, college graduates, they want to take a little bit of a reprieve from the education experience and really jump right into working. I, I would say you really want to maximize your program and what you come out with in college, and you want to go ahead and parlay that into pursuing your PMP as quickly as possible. The reason for that, the PMP obviously gives you the legitimacy, uh, it gives you the certification, but it, it more importantly connects you to a community of like-minded professionals, right, that you can connect with, share experiences with, um, mm -hmm. be able to learn best practices, and I think that is really important. And, as an employer, we're always looking at people that really have that PMP. So it's a it's a matter of combining your education uh, with the project management professional certification. That's kind of that one-two punch that tells a prospective employer this person is really engaged in their career. This is really the path they want to go down to, uh, in in their profession, and they're bought into getting the work done uh, to get them there. So. I think that's really critical just to jump right in and, uh, you know, embrace the uh, education to get the PMP immediately. Excellent. Good advice. Um, and I wanted to call out, um, Angela had mentioned that Amazon um, has a Hire Our Heroes program as well. So there are definitely different programs in the area with uh, some of the larger employers that are supporting um, former military, which is awesome. That's great. Thanks for sharing that, Angie. Um, okay, so right now, let's see if we've got any questions with regard to skills, abilities, and education, and what we've been talking about, um, BSU's online programs, some of the different military programs we have, um, different ways to skill up. I am checking Q and A. <clears throat> Not seeing anything. Okay, we are going to move on to our next section. So we're going to be talking about kind of in the same vein, but a little bit different training and certifications, right? So according to PMI, um, the earning power for, and again, sorry, there we go. The earning power for, uh, 
PMs, for example, with a PMP report like 16% higher than average salary. And this is like over 40 countries. So this is not just the United States. So it's pretty ubiquitous. Um, so essentially, I guess let's start with Josh. Do certifications still push candidate resumes to the top of the pile? You know, if so, uh, can you kind of talk a little bit about maybe what your clients prefer in terms of the project management rules? Is it CAPM, PMP, or are they looking for risk management or program management? Yeah, I would say it, it really de uh, depends on the client. So some clients, it's a requirement where you need to have the PMP certification and some clients would rather see the experience, but I think ultimately having the certification, it definitely gives the employer knowledge that, or the confidence that you have the knowledge of the baseline of it. So I, I've used this in the past, but if two candidates are the same and one has the PMP certification and the other doesn't, they're probably gonna go with the one with the certification, right? Um, so I, I definitely think it's still relevant, but like I said, it's it depends on the client and what the seniority level might be. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, we do have a couple of follow-up questions. I'm just going to interject. So Stephen had asked in the IT world, most PMs are tech PMs and a lot of companies are now asking and expecting PMs to do sales and marketing also. Um, so how do you train or let me or incorporate marketing skills in your programs? And so I'm assuming that's going to be maybe a question for, I don't know, Todd, do you think that's part of uh, the education? Do you guys include that as part of your content for your curriculum? We do. So in our, uh, if a student signs in for the bachelor's of project management, what they would do is they would sign the, uh, they would also complete a certificate. So one of those certificates, for example, is in uh, Kobe, right? And so, or they might do communication. Gotcha. And mm -hmm. so we tried to de develop our program. And another one is in cyber. So we, we developed a program so that students could customize their major mm -hmm. getting mm -hmm. PM skills, but then uh, adding the classes which make the most sense for them. Perfect. So it's kind of like having micro credentials. That's great. Right. Um, yeah, nice. Um, so Brian, in Blue Cross, as as PMs are continuing to do internal education, continuing education units, does Blue Cross handle anything like that specific to project managers? Probably not that specific. Yeah. Yeah, not that specific, Cheryl, but we still do put a premium on people having their PMP. I, I echo what Josh mm -hmm. said. When you're looking at two equal candidates, you know, the PMP is really going to make a difference in your decision. Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think we we look at, you know, just the continuing education curve and, uh, you know, we provide uh, programs and support, which is a great thing about Blue Cross of Idaho, um, is, is helping to mentor and continue um, providing educational opportunities and support uh, mm -hmm. for those people that want to continue to grow in their uh, project management professional growth. So, yeah, we're okay. very supportive here. But PMP, we still have, uh, we still put a premium on having that certification. Yeah. I wanted to add one thing to that, Cheryl, if I could. So, sure. oh, please. you know, um, one, I mean, to say what, a little along the same lines as Brian was sharing that, you know, jumping right from your, from graduating into getting your PMP. I mean, um, Jim Quick, who it wrote the book Limitless and Quick Brain and Brain Power and that, he says the, the faster you learn, the faster you earn. Um, but then also it, it dawned on me, I mean, if you are, if some companies definitely want to see that PMP and some don't, you don't want to limit yourself in in the opportunities that you have in front of you. So, you you know, having that PMP, you're going to have access to other to opportunities that other people may not. And that's also going to help you advance in your career and, and be part of a candidate pool and in a community that that um, you have access to opportunities that, that others don't. So I, I think mm -hmm. the PMP certification, jump in and get it, um, enhance it and, and enhance your opportunities and, and optimize your opportunity for for your career. Right. No, I, I would echo that. And I think uh, that's one of the reasons why PMI, I think, has the PMP, of course, but also the micro credentials so that to Todd's point and what Brian was saying as well. Uh, and, and Steve had posed this question. Needs change, right? Uh, needs change within organizations. And so PMI has, I think, been pretty sensitive to that and coming up with their different micro credentialing programs, which is great because then you can kind of specialize into Todd's point. They call it a certificate. PMI calls it a micro credential, but it's kind of the same thing in the sense that you're sort of, it's like a minor 
um, instead of a major, it's a minor, right? Study in your in your degree program. So um, I, I think we have to have that because needs do change. Um, I did want to also address. So I think Tammy had submitted. Yes, here we go. Tammy was asking about um, the students in your program, Todd. Uh, do they follow on for PMI certification? And I think you kind of alluded to that. Yeah, that's the whole plan. Is that you? you've actually worked with PMI on their global accreditation uh, process to ensure that your program, once these students go through that, it actually gives them the credits they need to sit for the exam, yeah? That's correct. At least we have the system set up that if that's what they want to do, they can. Uh, some students may decide that, you know, sitting for the certification isn't what they're interested in doing and, and that's okay, we can still support them. In our program, we actually, uh, we've developed sort of, and Cheryl, this refers back to something you were talking about earlier. There's a difference in being a project manager, being, say, being a project coordinator. You didn't mm -hmm. use them, as I'm using them. And we actually developed a, a class for both of them. So if somebody is going to say shadow, let's say mm -hmm. Brian as an example, one mm -hmm. of our students shadows Brian in, in a project, they would sign up for us for project men, or project coordinate or a project practicum as opposed to internship, right? So we actually, we provide uh, both of those opportunities in the program. Great, that's awesome. Um, so Kendra had put in, as someone who's invested a lot of uh, undergraduate and graduate degree, as well as trying to get her PMP, what options are someone who's financially cannot sustain one degree or additional education? Um, what are their options for that? So, I, you know, I, that's a great question. I, I, from a PMI perspective, um, Kendra, if you're a PMI member, there's some micro-credentials you can do that are very low cost and they're easy to maintain because you don't have to do continuing yet. You don't have to do the PDUs, so that would be one way. Um, Allison, you want to jump in on that and see if there's anything you could add to that? Yeah, I think there are a lot of resources that I share with our Mission 43 members that are also valuable in the civilian workspace, right? Um, I highly recommend PMI micro credentials. <laughs> we can't say that enough. <laughs> they are amazing. I love them. Right, um, right. But, you know, and if, but if cost is truly a barrier, Coursera, I mean, there's a ton out there for mm. free. Um, there's, there's just really awesome ways linkedin learning add those badges to your linkedin profile and then if you're if you're not a online learner that's not your favorite um coming to pmi chapter meetings and going through the mentorship and and really just working on and developing those skills mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. No, I, I agree. Um, I was reading, uh, Brian Russell was commenting how Project Bytes is a valuable option for, for PMP training and he's right. So Project Bytes is one of those uh, benefits that Tammy, um, she manages that for our chapter and it's a free benefit for our members. And essentially you have like over 300 audio video, you know, bytes, right? These are 20 minute AV files that if you listen to three of them, you've got yourself a, a, a continuing, you know, a one hour PDU uh, 1.0, which is great. And then also, in addition to that, if you're just trying to augment um, some of the training, um, Kendra, and I know you're a chapter member, this would be a great way to do that as well. Um, so there are definitely, uh, projectmanagement.com, by the way, is also another place to go for some uh, less expensive and free um, learning materials. Uh, let's see, we're going to move on a little bit. Um, we do want to talk a little bit about, and, and we kind of touched on this on how it's important for project managers to sort of expand, kind of be more into marketing and maybe finance, and maybe cyber even. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about cyber certifications and, um, you know, whether it makes sense for, for project managers to have that kind of training. Um, I think we... Allison, you've got security or cybersecurity background and you've got your certs, um, but you had mentioned you thought it was really more the other way around, that it's if a cyber analyst had project management skills, that's really where you're seeing the benefit of that? Yes, and I, I have cybersecurity certifications, but don't ask me to use them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wouldn't call it a background, but I do. There is there's a lot of value. And I, I think what we're seeing is a lot of cybersecurity and a lot of technology. I think this is mentioned in comments as well. A lot of technology mm -hmm. employers are really recognizing that um, that on top of your core coding or whatever skills you might have, they need someone to lead those teams. They need someone to manage those projects. They need someone to be over the incident responses. And so having a project management certification on top of your cybersecurity expenses or experience is, is making people who are already greatly employable 
even more marketable. Mm -hmm. Well, and I know, Brian, you mentioned uh, for, for Blue Cross, uh, you're not looking for certifications necessarily, but if your project managers have cybersecurity background or knowledge or training, that's a plus. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a bonus to have that training, especially in today's uh, you know age. Uh, but it's not really a necessity. So I, I think we have a fairly robust training program here. And mm -hmm. trust me, if you were to come on as a project manager at Blue Cross of Idaho, you're going to get the cyber training. It just <laughs> it just happens native natively. So uh, right. Yeah, I I would say it's probably a bonus, but not not really something mm -hmm. that we're focused on when we're hiring. Right. Right. Um, Josh, when you're working with your clients, you work with um, I, I, the IT industry predominantly, right? For most of your talent acquisition, are you seeing requests for, from your clients where project managers are needing to have more cybersecurity knowledge or training? Yeah, I think, like everyone said, right, cybersecurity is so important these days. We've all seen things in the news where companies are getting hacked or whatever it might be. But we did, we, we've had a couple of clients where they specifically looked for cybersecurity project managers mm -hmm. where they've only worked on cybersecurity projects. But I think having the cyber background is only going to help you for sure. You know, if mm -hmm. it's not a specific cybersecurity position, if you can add that to your resume, then that's going to make you stick out for sure. Right. I, I was just making some notes here. I think uh, that's one another one of the areas that I think PMI has been kind of you know, dipping their toes in the water a little bit in terms of getting a micro credential for cyber for, for project managers. So we'll see where that goes. Uh, let's see how we doing on time. So 707, um, do we have more questions deeper in career? Okay. So Alex, for those deeper in their career, what are your thoughts on positioning your transferable skills or building skill set if you want to move into um, a PM role in a different business category where you may not have had much or any experience, uh, for example, IT to medical. Um, Amanda, you want to take that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, similar to, to the military uh, moving to civilian, it, the skills are transferable. And um, and while the, the industry might be different or the, the vertical might be different, those skills are still very relevant and you would approach the fundamentals the same way. So being able to craft your resume and your accomplishments um, and deliverables to align to the job based on the core skills is going to be key. But I, I see that all the time. I work with candidates all the time. And, and talent that are looking to move into a different different industry and especially moving from IT, st strictly IT into health, that health IT space is, you cannot go wrong <laughs> in that space <laughs> right now. So that's definitely one that pairs very, very nicely together. And, uh, and either way, go health to IT, IT to health um, is definitely, I mean, they're, they're symbiotic for sure. Yeah, it sounds like uh, when we were talking earlier about military, it's just about being able to translate your skills, right? To, to translate them to the new language. And sometimes you wouldn't know what language that is, right? Because you know mm -hmm. the language. And my sister, for example, is talking E6, E5. I'm like, I don't know what that means. But, <laughs> um, but then working with somebody, like working with a recruiter, working at how, you know, contact me. I mean, I can help translate that. Like go to the people that, that know that are subject matter experts in that into resume writing, into how to elevate your, your resume, elevate your accomplishments, make it marketable so that it does stand out. Um, I would go, I, I don't come to me for project management, <laughs> like expertise, mm -hmm. but I would go to you guys for project management. So find the expert in your area, in your life, um, work with a recruiter. Recruiters are always willing to I love working on resumes. I love rewriting resumes. I love gathering the information and, and helping translate that to what makes sense for the, the opportunities that you're looking at. Mm -hmm. Sounds like we need to hold some kind of a workshop at some point and make it fun one evening. Hmm, food for thought. Um, okay, great. Uh, let's see. There is one thing we wanted to kind of talk. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this whole ageism thing between seasoned project managers, right? How do they combat the stigma of ageism in reverse? How to demonstrate skills and abilities for those who are younger in their careers, maybe less experienced. Um, we've talked a little bit about obtaining maybe what a, what a two year, like a cap M type of program or a four year PMP make a difference in perception of ability to do the job. And I know we've all talked. Yeah. PMP is, you know, the gold standard. And if you see that, that's great. But what if you saw PMP 
but you only saw maybe one year of experience on the resume. Um, Allison, how would you coach that person to, to try to show that they can do the job? You know, I think I'm probably not the best to answer this, but within our community, I, we refer people all the time. It, and I know not to sound like a broken record, but it really is about translating those skills and being able to highlight what you do have in a way that speaks that employer's knowledge. Mm -hmm. And so if it's a certain industry that you're interested in, how do those skills apply to that industry? And so instead of thinking, you know, I worked on an aircraft and did this, it's mm -hmm. I solved this problem and this is why it helped me. And here's the mm -hmm. skills that I would translate. And here's exactly. how I would problems in your area. Makes sense. Josh, if someone came to you and they were looking for a position and again, they just, you know, I think Kendra had mentioned, right, I've got all these skills and I'm getting my PMP and I've got my degree, but I may not have all this experience. How, do, how does she market herself? Yeah, so I think Allison mentioned a great point. It's it's taking your real life experiences and transitioning or translating that into a professional career, right? And showing a commitment to wanting to learn or growing with whether it's getting a certification mm -hmm. or education. Um, and then, you know, PMI has a great network of people where I'm sure, like specifically the mentor and mentee program where they could help out and maybe give you some tips on or like advice on interviews or questions to ask people to try to meet with. So I think translating your real life skills, there's something there that will mm -hmm. hopefully translate mm -hmm. into a project management type role. Mm -hmm. um, so that's probably what I would suggest. And then, you know, on the flip side, if someone's a little later on in their career, I'd probably have them, really push on their soft skills, right? And just explain the range of different industries that they worked in or different types of personalities they've had to work with. Um, and that's valuable too, you know, that's, it, there's mm -hmm. not, it, on both sides, right? Either later on in the career or early on in the career. Right. You can't, like, there's there's value in both, obviously, so. Right. And, and Todd, so for someone who's later in their career, right, someone who's seasoned, but maybe they don't have their degree um, and they are looking to make their resume look more robust, it seems like your online program at Boise State for project management would be a great mechanism for them, right? They could continue working, but your classes are online and so you kind of are able to work around people's schedules. It seems like it'd be perfect for a non-trad student. It would actually, uh, in particular, if they already have a bunch of experience, but, and there, there, there certainly are people in the position where they have the experience, but they need a process to help document that experience and prep that information and get ready for the, uh, for the test. And so if you're in, if somebody's in that situation, uh, signing up for the classes, doing the certificate, cause you can do cer certificates for us as a post baccalaureate student, you don't have to sign up for the full degree or we can tra we could certainly translate that into a degree. Uh, and the core mm -hmm. courses would not take very long to, uh, to work through, uh, for somebody who is in that situation. Okay. So it sounds like we do have, um, you know, that we know that there is, a. a Sometimes I, I hate to use the word stigma, but uh, stigma, I guess, with someone who's, you know, more advanced in their careers. And I know we talked a little bit about um, yesterday we were prepping. Uh, I was joking about um, not wanting to put all of the experience right out on LinkedIn, right? At some point, you kind of maybe cut it off. <laughs> So it doesn't look like you've been working since you were 12. Um, so Amanda, I think you were the one who kind of jumped on that. We were kind of joking about uh, there is kind of a way to present yourself in a way that even if you have, um, let's say my first job was in the 1970s, right? I'm probably not going to list that. Yeah. Right. So I would say taking the relevant experience and, and what, um, as your career has progressed, we may not need to show, you know, starting out as this, this is, and building, but really showing that relevant and not eliminating that because we can definitely um, enter some skills and things like that and enlist those and detail those detail mm -hmm. those skills out. Um, but definitely there are ways. I mean, I don't, I always remove the year somebody graduated if it happens to be on their resume. Um, work and I also work very closely with managers and, and the decision makers to ensure that it's an environment that is that they're open to that. I mean, that, that, you know, I don't want to work with anybody that's going to be like 
looking at somebody's age. That's just not like ethical to me. So as a recruiter working directly with them, I can help also market your your skills say this is what they've done even on the other side on the flip side if it's you know one year two years experience you have the education but maybe you don't like josh and, and allison said tapping into your experience i work with people who are coming back into the workforce and maybe they haven't worked for a number of years but they've been a den leader or they've done those are i mean managing like 10 year old boys like and trying to get them <laughs> find what derby okay. thing done i mean that's like a huge project in itself so being able to list things that you wouldn't necessarily think are you're getting paid for, that's still experience that you can mm -hmm. include. These are the projects that I've been a part of, and these are the outcomes that have happened. And I think that's the big thing is listing the accomplishments, the outcome of those projects and and how you contributed and what your what your role was in there. But definitely I think that going to an expert in that in that area, if that's a concern or you feel like that might be something that is holding you back and you know, have somebody take a look at your resume, work with somebody mm -hmm. that can help promote you in the, in with opportunities that you're looking at. Um, ask what your resume looks like. Say, how can I prepare? What, what language am I using? Like, how do I um, enhance and, and really highlight my skills and not mm -hmm. other factors that people might see um, right on your resume? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Well, guys, I think um, we're a little bit um, short on time. So I'm going to just jump to the next section. And then if we have any questions on this, we'll continue to watch the Q&A. So our next section is really talking about kind of what you were just saying, Amanda, working with uh, recruiters and, and helping having them help you to analyze your resume, kind of focus on things that are important for that particular job that you're trying to interview for or whatever, as opposed to maybe throwing everything out there that you've done. Maybe you just kind of dial it back a little bit and focus on the things that are important. So in this section, we're going to talk about recruiters, social media, Gen Z, right? And we're going to talk about how Indeed, LinkedIn, ZipRecruiter, all of these are predominantly used by Gen Z. Millennials, maybe baby boomers still want a little bit of human contact. So that kind of uh, is a little bit of a challenge for the for the folks in the recruiting field. But um, so let's talk a little bit about the benefits, right, of working with a recruiter to find your dream job, right? What services and support should job seekers expect from this collaboration? Uh, Amanda, you want to jump in? I would love to. <laughs> um, <laughs> working with a recruiter will definitely change how you navigate your career, because when I work with somebody, I, I mean, I've placed many people and worked with many people multiple times over in their career. Um, I am their career advocate. It isn't like at the top of the meeting. It's not a one and done. It is a journey. It is a career path. It is how do we get you from A to B, A to B to C, and what are your short-term goals? What do you want right now? And what mm -hmm. are your long-term goals? And how can, and my job, and what I love to do is strategize and how to ensure that you're hitting your and that we are able to facilitate and navigate to your short-term goals, but also making sure that they align to your long-term goals and what mm -hmm. opportunities are going to allow you to, to get there and how do we navigate that? The other thing is a lot of times you see the job description that is written possibly by some more than likely somebody from HR who may not have may not know what the the decision maker is looking at so or, or is looking for so the person that's reviewing your resume as the decision maker may be looking for something you might have everything that's on the job description we're working with the recruiter i'm working directly with the decision maker and the hiring manager so i know what their goals are i know what their objectives are i know what they need to hit i know what they're looking for and mm -hmm. i can help pull that information out from you know, working with you as the, as the candidate and the talent and making sure that those are the things that we're highlighting and marketing against. So that automatically kind of sets you apart from mm -hmm. other people that may be in that same candidate pool um, who don't have that insight or aren't, um, you know, aren't privy to that information. Um, but I think that the, the biggest thing is I'm here to help. I love doing this. I love looking at resumes, interview prep, understanding who you're going to be meeting with as a, as a hiring panel or an interview panel, making sure that you're, you're prepared because it really, not all the time and very almost never is it the person who's the most experienced or the most, and that ends up being the person who's the most prepared that gets the job um, because they're able to know what you're mm -hmm. wanting, they know what to anticipate, they know what they're walking into, they know how to, and, it, and that it aligns with what their goals are as well. So it's a mutual, it's mutually beneficial um, working with a recruiter to make sure that your goals are aligned with the company's goals. And it's just a great marriage from there. 
Right. I have to say personally, um, of course, I've always enjoyed working with you when I was at Xperis and um, did appreciate that you always went the extra mile and knew what the client exactly was looking for. And so it was a good fit because um, there wasn't this awkward, gee, I don't know if this is going to work kind of thing. Let's try it because you've already done the homework. <laughs> you'd already uh, prepped me. You'd already prepped the client. It was great. So I appreciate that. And I, I'm sure that is the case, um, Josh, when you're working with clients as well, right? You're spending that extra time getting to know them. And so that's one of the benefits of working with recruiters. And I guess um, the only thing I would add to that is how do our, for these folks who are interested, right? How do how do they meet recruiters? It seems like through Indeed and through uh, LinkedIn and all of that, you're talking to chat bots for the most part. How do they actually reach out to you? I can put my contact information. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, I mean, is it, is it just like trying to find you on LinkedIn and then trying to, trying to make that connection? You know, a know. lot of the majority that I get are referrals, LinkedIn. Um, I heard from a friend of a friend of a friend. It, it's a lot of that. And Boise is such a small community. It really is. I mean, right. it's very network friendly. And, right. um, and mm -hmm. you know, so that's, it, that's the biggest thing. So if you even just talk to somebody and say, oh, I'm looking for a new job, they will route you. Somehow you will get routed to a recruiter. But I would also look at, um, you know, if you're going into the tech space, like what what companies and what recruiters specialize in that tech space? Mm -hmm. What if you're looking to go into the financial space, like a you know financial project manager, what companies specialize in that? That's where you want to align yourself and make sure that the recruiters that you're working with, that it's a good, it's a good fit. It's a good pairing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for sure. So I, I would say word of mouth is a big one, but also look, I mean, you're going to have to put the work into do the, do the research, but LinkedIn, I mean, I'm really active on LinkedIn. I'm sure Josh is as well. Like, Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. that's that's fair. Um, so as far as um, the this online presence, Brian, when you are doing interviews these days, do you bring people in now or is it online initially or how does that work? Yeah, predominantly it's online, um, okay. Cheryl. I mean, you know, we utilize all kinds of connections to reach out via social media, our own networks to to drum up business. Obviously, HR works through uh, recruiting partners. Mm -hmm. um, but really, when we are sitting down doing interviews, it's primarily all via um, via Zoom meetings or mm -hmm. remote, how, remote. How does that, d does it change for you in terms of the dynamic instead of sitting in a room with someone and kind of reading body language and all of that, and it's more online presence? How does that translate? Is it easier, harder to make a final decision? I think it's a little bit more challenging, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Obviously, sitting in a room with somebody, you can really read uh, their reaction to uh, to the questions you're asking, their responses, you get that direct feedback. Um, I think it just it just um, showcases the fact that you need to use a little bit more of your perceptions in terms of the the mm -hmm. answers and the way people are reacting to the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it just it necessitates you pay a little more attention uh, to really their responses, mm -hmm. um, and you have to do a little bit of reading between the lines to some extent. Um, mm -hmm. So. I think that becomes more of a challenge, but I think we've been successfully able to navigate through that. We've got some great right. candidates. So. Right. So um, Amanda and Josh, when you're working with folks and you're finding clients and they're doing those online interviews, do you find that you're having to do role playing differently to, to train people how to interview in an online format? Um, I think there's a lot more preparation up front for sure. You know, mm -hmm. I always recommend whether it's on Zoom or Teams, test that link like an hour before you go on. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's been many right. times where, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just something to make sure like you're checking all your boxes. Um, and then I also always recommend wear something professional, at least a shirt, right? You don't have to <laughs> wear slacks in a Zoom interview, but you don't want to be wearing a headband. You don't want to be wearing a tank top. You don't mm -hmm. want to be wearing a, mm -hmm. a baseball cap. You know, treat it as an in-person interview. Mm -hmm. um, arrive a few minutes early and just make sure your microphone and, and your, your camera works and just mm -hmm. try your best. You know, it's a little mm -hmm. bit different, but with some practice or some research, you know, there are some interview tips for specifically on, on Zoom. And yes, we do help out with that because a lot of our clients have been doing that for the last two, three years. Sure. But Okay. Well, interesting. Oh, so somebody want to jump in? Oh, I was just going to say, I think also just when, when I do interview prep for a virtual interview, what, what is their background? Um, where are they looking? Uh, I, it, 
it's weird because in person you'd say like make eye contact, you know, make sure that you're connecting with them. But sometimes they're looking at the screen and you kind of have to set the stage on both sides, right? Like working with the client to help them understand how to bed, how to best interview virtually and the candidate. So definitely it's, it's on both sides that I'm finding now, whereas predominantly before it was like meeting with the candidate, making sure, okay, what are you going to wear? What are you going to, how are you going to answer mm -hmm. this question? How are you going to tell you about yourself? Like things like that. And now it's, it's that have a glass of water. Your voice is going to get exactly <laughs> at times. Make sure, you know, things like that. that True. Uh, yeah. Oh, good. No, that's that's all great advice. And I, I do think that's changing. So I think it's it's worth having that discussion. Um, let's see, I wanted to just quickly, so salaries, right? Everyone always wants to know how salaries are, are doing, uh, how they're going for PMs. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, any major changes? Or is it a steady increase? Or pretty much the same as every other other position? I think it depends, right? <laughs> you can always say it depends. But you know, for for the most part, over the last two, three years, salaries have gone up here in Boise. I know it's not going to compare to Seattle, but, you know, it is a lot closer than it was before the pandemic, mm -hmm. um, especially with the, the reality of companies allowing people to sit remote. You know, California, Portland, these mm -hmm. big cities are taking talent in Boise, so companies have had to adjust, but... Right. You know, PMs are anywhere from sixty thousand dollars to two hundred thousand dollars. It just kind of depends what you're doing and how many years of experience you've had. Mm -hmm. but. Well, I I noticed there was uh, something that was posted on LinkedIn today. Camus Freeman had commented on it. It had to do with the percentage of companies that were remote, and I think Idaho placed was it 26.3% or something like that. So not up in the thirties. Uh, so they weren't up in the top 10, but they also weren't in the bottom 10 either. So you touched on some of your companies doing things, you know, remotely. And, and uh, I wonder if that plays a role sometimes in salaries because you're not actually having to live where you work. Right. And so to some extent, maybe you can live where there's, less of a need to compensate right for the living uh, mm -hmm. expenses there like if you lived in san francisco versus boise um so interesting i see that but i also there is a trend now where companies are are looking at right sizing based on where the the person sits so at the beginning of the pandemic definitely very true that california bay area could come in and and pay 30 percent more than what the mm -hmm. talent in boise was getting but still be 20 percent lower than what they were paying you know in the bay area whereas now they're really it's starting to level out like where they're making um salary decisions based on where the talent is sitting. There's still some pockets here and there, but uh, definitely we're, we're seeing that kind of um, even out a little bit, especially with this, people are going hybrid as well. I've seen that increase quite a bit now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to try to get a couple more topics in before we end up. We're at uh, 725, according to my laptop. So I'm going to, if I can do this right... Move on to project management methods and tools. I want to talk a little bit about um, Agile, right? Pure Agile seems to kind of be taking a back seat to more hybrid methods, right? Microsoft Project is now looking to have competition with things like Jira, Monday.com, Smartsheet. Um, so let's start with Brian, I guess. Is um, Agile experience still kind of all the rage, right? Or are we sort of turning more toward that hybrid model of project management where some aspects of the management um, project lifecycle, as an example, are adaptive, right? Uh, whereas others um, like development are more, or excuse me, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Some project management aspects, right, of the life cycle are adaptive. Some are predictive. Planning obviously is going to be more predictive. Development is going to be more adaptive. How is the change in the direction sort of affecting project managers, right, in terms of their kind of expected skills and abilities for this sort of straddling both worlds, adaptive and predictive? Yeah, I, I mean, we operate in a hybrid environment here at Blue Cross of Idaho, and it really is kind of elevating the fact that you know, it's not just enough to be a project management uh, project manager anymore and having project management skills. You need to have either experience or direct knowledge with Agile. And so mm -hmm. having that experience really benefits the connection and working in a hybrid environment. So I think today in today's world, at least for us, having, uh, you know, a CSPO or having a PMI Agile certi certification, I think is really critical. 
Um, I think the future is really the hybrid environment, uh, particularly in the insurance industry. Um, we're very heavily regulated, so you need that strict project management and what waterfall brings uh, to the table, but you also want to have the flexibility with your development teams to be able to work in a in an agile type of environment where you're running spit sprints, you're doing horizon planning. Um, all of that really needs to fit into an overall schedule for the project. So, you know, we have uh, we have uh, Jira. Um, and we utilize Jira. We've just uh, converted to that recently, um, and we're looking at moving to a new project management tool. Um, we looked at Monday.com. We're going to go with one called Work Otter. But what's critical is that those two tools can seamlessly mm -hmm. interact with each other. Right. That's that's a critical piece, right, is making sure that all of these tools can work together so that you're not having to do double data entry in one system and another and introducing errors, obviously, or or incorrect information when you're doing reporting and that sort of thing. So interesting. Um, so yeah, so hybrid, I think I agree. That's kind of what I've heard as well. And I think, frankly, that's kind of always been the way those of us are ancient, right? Old as dirt. Um, we used to call it iterative prototyping, right? As opposed to, or, you know, rad, right? <laughs> Rapid application development, um, kind of the same thing, just uh, packaged a little differently. And maybe the reporting's a little bit different in terms of how you track the progress and stuff. So interesting. Um, so so let's see, Amanda, with regard to um, Agile, right, and your, your clients asking for project managers, how do you, how, how does a project manager sort of purport themselves? Do they come in more like a scrum master or a program manager? Because typically in a true Agile environment, you really don't have project managers, right? Right. No, absolutely. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know that I have yet to see a pure <laughs> agile <laughs> environment. Right. Um, yeah. I do think that it's always kind of been a customizable agile. Like people mm -hmm. um, transitioned into to agile, but there were always flavors of waterfall and, and other mm -hmm. um, other types of, of methodologies that that were, and it needed to be that way, right? Because it mm -hmm. needed to meet the demands of the business, and sometimes that a pure agile environment doesn't meet all the demands of business. So I think that um, it, it gets a little, it, it's a hybrid across the board, honestly, because mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. I've had an agile, a pure agile environment, but then they want a business analyst. I'm like, well, I don't know that that <laughs> goes there, but um, <laughs> so I, I think that it'll be, con it'll continue to customize and, and they'll have different flavors of agile at different seasons mm -hmm. in, in the, the business cycle. So um there are some, I know Blue Cross Vito, very specific scrum master, product owner and things like that. But then on the other side, they do have some project managers like Brian mentioned. So it, I don't know that there's a, a surefire way to say, yes, market yourself as this and then you'll move mm -hmm. into to that. So mm -hmm. I think that just having that agile mindset as well and other people that I've worked with project managers that during the big transition and everybody moving to agile, they're like, well, I don't have agile. I'm like, you probably do. You just don't, it's never been called agile because there's, it's just kind of ingrained like innately, like people are agile and they kind of go with that, that same um, methodology. So I think again, working with the recruiter is in somebody in that field or, or somebody in PMI, you know, using your Network to understand what makes sense for the different opportunities that you're mm -hmm. looking at, or how to get, you know, mapping your your short term to your long term. Um, what companies are going to allow you to navigate that through and, and get right. there? But I don't know that there's a surefire way to go and always go in as a scrum master and then advance, you know, that way. Right. So, Todd, in your um, project management program, I assume you guys touch on um, agile classes. We might have talked about this before. That you have certain components that you bring up as far as agile training. Yes, in all in all three classes, really, um, uh, there both are sort of or not both, but a variety of approaches are represented, and we encourage students to reach out, try to get a sense of what their sector will likely anticipate or want them to do, and to try to customize what they need out of the program to fit what they're what, you know, mm -hmm. in terms of their career. Right. Okay. So uh, we are really out of time, but I just want to really quickly, generative artificial intelligence, right? We can't not talk about this a little bit uh, in terms of how it impacts project managers uh, in, in, as far as like generating schedules and that kind of stuff. So Brian, uh, has Blue Cross tapped into this at all uh, as far as helping their project managers with charters, schedules, generating work breakdown structures, whatever? Yeah, not quite that uh, that far in terms of the maturity around that space, uh, Cheryl. But 
We do have a, a data analytics team that utilizes, you know, artificial intelligence uh, heavily and running through data, identifying patterns, doing all of that work. So it's really just mm -hmm. been used more as a tool to uh, mm -hmm. to aggregate and find uh, patterns and data, less around what we're doing in the project management space. Gotcha. Okay, fair enough. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we're kind of out of time, but I wanted to mention, I know BSU is taking a look at generative AI to help with teaching classes. As an example, <clears throat> one of the professors was saying how, so the students can learn on topics that they care about. They're going to use generative AI to actually create their case study with um, the research that they do through this generative AI, then they essentially do the, the class with their own data. And then there's a syllabus and obviously rubrics and all that, that they get graded on in terms of the results of the case study, the analysis they do, those kinds of things. So, the, so all the students are jumping through the same hoops and learning the same thing, but they're all learning it uh, with content that they care about. I thought, wow, that's brilliant. Kind of cool. And then I've also heard from others that some of their companies don't allow them to use generative AI. And in fact, <laughs> if they're caught using it, it could be grounds for dismissal. So yeah, I think uh, jury's still out, I guess, in terms of how that's gonna be used um, in environments, but we have to talk about it just for a quick second. Um, that, guys, really brings us to kind of open mic and we are at the end of time here because I know we're three minutes over, I apologize. Excuse me, but it looks like I'm looking in the Q&A to see if there's anything additional. I don't see any additional questions. So I think we did um, address most of those, which is great. Um, any parting comments, thoughts? Allison, let's start with you. Oh, goodness. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me, Cheryl, and for letting me wear two hats. If anyone has any questions about the process of transitioning from the military into project management, mm -hmm. I'm happy to help. Um, also, I think on AI, if you are not somehow, some way on that train, you're going to be left behind. <laughs> right. But that's yeah. my thoughts. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Amanda? Yeah, no, thank you again. And and I would say that if you are in a position hearing everything that we that we spoke about and especially those transferable skills, if you're in a position where you are looking at candidates for your company, have that open mind and, and really promote that um, to others on your team to look at those skills and how they transfer and because you could be missing out on some some solid talent there. Agreed. Josh. Yeah, just thanks. This is great. I really enjoyed it. And um, if you have any questions about you know, resumes or interview tips or anything that we can do at Apex to help out, please reach out. We have, you know, a team of seven here in Boise. So uh, like I said, just happy to help and be a resource if, if anyone's looking for one. Awesome. Well, we'll get all that contact information out for the for the uh, folks who attended when we send out the slide deck and the, the recording for this. So um, you can expect some phone calls, I'm sure. Um, Todd, did you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, likewise, just thank you very much uh, to all the panelists, to you, Cheryl, and to everybody who attended. Uh, one comment very uh, globally is I love that there are some similarities between recruiting, retraining, and educational environments, mm -hmm. right? that there's, you know, that we're sort of rowing in a similar direction. I think that that's, you know, really fantastic. So that's that's been enjoyable to listen to as well as participate in. Awesome. Great. And Brian? Yeah, just Cheryl, thanks for the opportunity to be on the panel tonight. I think this has been a great discussion. Uh, I learned some things and hopefully uh, other people did as well, but uh, really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, I, I definitely did. I've taken uh, quite a few notes here, so you guys can all expect me to be tapping you for certain things. So, <laughs> Hey, listen, I just want to take a quick moment to say thank you so much to this amazing panel. Um, and I really appreciate all of the time uh, that you put into doing the dry run with me. And then this evening, much appreciated. And uh, thanks to everyone who stuck with us for just a few minutes over. Appreciate that. And uh, I'll be sending out the recording, um, the slide deck, and obviously some communication information, contact information for our panelists if you would like to pursue any of the um, different programs they have and different services they offer. And uh, thanks everybody for, for um, joining us tonight and we appreciate your time and y'all have a good evening. And we'll see you next month in person in October uh, for our case study workshop. So hopefully you can join us then. Thanks everyone. <laughs>